So welcome, my name is Ellen, and I'm going to do the talk today. Um, first, I, maybe some of you ran into traffic. Today's the CIM, 40th anniversary of CIM. So um, at this point, the front runners are done, and what's left are the middle of the packers and the back of the packers. Does anybody in their practice ever feel like a mid-packer or a backpacker? <laughs> So I can relate and we can practice this morning for their successful completion. Um, and then also I know a number of people in our Sangha are not feeling well. So we'll practice and dedicate our practice to their well-being as well. So my talk is about aha moments. You know, when you have one of those bursts, epiphanies, insights all of a sudden. And um, I'm going to talk about it kind of from the secular perspective, common understanding of what aha moments are, why they work, how they work. Um, and then also, you know, how does that relate to our Buddhist path? And, um, you know, what can we learn from that? So I'll, I'll talk a bit more about it, of course, but I wanted to pose a thought question so you can be noodling on it while I talk. See if you can remember a time when you've had an aha moment, an epiphany. And maybe you won't even remember what it was, but think about if you can remember an instance when that happened, what were you doing when it happened? And then how did you feel when it happened? So you can ponder on that. I'm going to talk for a little bit more and then we'll come back to that. So again, my name is Ellen Wolf. I'm a student here at Lions Roar, a student of Lama Yeshe Jimpas. I took refuge on June 1st of 2009. I looked it up. Um, so, but I'm on, I'm, I'm on the back of the packer. So just that I took refuge a while ago doesn't mean much, except that I'm on the slow path. <laughs> um, so there are a number of sources for this talk. A lot of the sort of common secular viewpoint of ahas is just, from the internet, some scientific journals, some talks, um, as it pertains to Buddhist uh, training, a lot of it comes from Lama Jimpa, and I'll mention that and other sources I'll mention as, as I go along. My motivation for this talk comes from several sources. I've always actually been interested in problem solving. I went to college initially to become an engineer because I wanted to you know, build good stuff for people or help people solve practical problems. And those were the kind of problems I was familiar with. And then I started working in an organization and I realized that sometimes organizations solve problems well and sometimes they don't solve problems well. And sometimes there are institutional factors that help them solve their problems better or worse. Um, and that motivated me to go to graduate school. And in graduate school, I kind of went to business school, but I studied organizational design. And then I also studied public policy and while I was there, I studied things like systems thinking and decision analysis, always trying to kind of up my game on decision making. So I've always been fascinated about how we make decisions individually and as communities. Um, so that's that's my primary motivation, I would say. But I also have a fascination in our Buddhist practice with connecting like day-to-day -day real life with deep Buddhist practices. For me, as a beginner, it's been beneficial to do that. You know, otherwise, the Buddhist path sits over here, and the rest of my life sits here. You know, and it's hard to reconcile them. And to the extent I can integrate them, then oh, I sound like I'm in a big tin can now, a submarine of sorts. Um, to the extent I can integrate them, it makes it easier. You know, and it makes it feel kind of, kind of collectively whole. So I, I always get interested in like real life topics and how they connect with the Buddhist path. So um, I think that's my second area of motivation. And my third area is I've gotten really intrigued lately in the Buddhist path about this sense of like energy fields, you know, the world outside of us and how we can tap in. There's some like woo woo magic stuff that I'm not completely aligned with, but to the extent I can tap into that in my path, it feels very powerful. So I'm kind of fascinated by that as well. Okay, so what is an aha moment? It, it is um, typically refers to the instance where you've been struggling with something and you can't get it, you know, and you are stuck. And then all of a sudden, later on, boom, you know, you get an insight, an answer, uh, a solution arises to you. 
Does anybody know who, who made common the phraseology aha moment? Oprah Winfrey did a talk on aha moments and it sort of got into the slang mainstream. It was popular. And in 2012, actually, Merriam Webster adopted it and stuck it in the dictionary. So that's kind of the aha moment being popularized. Um, so back to the initial question, did anybody remember when they might have had an aha moment in the past that would be willing to share? Aha, you raised your hand. Oh, come on, Bill. It's more fun. It's more fun if we share. We get Connor to run around in his cross-country shirt, too. That's good. Well, uh, that's a challenge, but... Um, you got to hold it. You know, you got to hold the, it. Yeah. In the world, thank you. Yeah. I have depth perception problems. Um, the um, aha moments as a creative in the, the world of uh, content production, uh, fluid, constant, ongoing, mm -hmm. um, almost hard to measure. And so when you're, when you're in that space professionally and the origin of that uh, path towards the creative um, process um, starts young, I think. I think you're, you're always solving puzzles and curious visually. So for me, it's fluid. There's no, there's no beginning. Mm. There's no moment. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. And so can you reflect at all about how you feel when it's working, when it's working it's always for you? working. Okay. Does it feel There's good or does it feel bad? It'd be nice to have an off switch. Okay. Well, that's good. Maybe you can sell some of your ahas because some of the rest of us would like more probably. Anybody else? I think I saw hands. Susan. So my aha moment, the first one that popped in my head <clears throat> has to do with my practice. And it was a few years ago. Um, when I was going through a lot, there was a lot of turmoil and sadness and difficulty in my life. And I just was at a loss. I didn't know what to do. And, um, I might've shared this before because it was such a profound moment for me. And, um, I spoke to Susan Farrar and she said, you need to do some meta for yourself. And and that's something that was kind of new to me because I tended to do Tonglen or Meta or Tara for other people, you know, who are suffering, but never for myself. Um, and she said, so think of four things that you want to give yourself, you know. Um, so I did. And I started, I mean, I was in really bad shape. <laughs> and so I started doing that and and giving myself this love and support that um, I wasn't getting, you know, from elsewhere. So I gave it to myself and I did it for, I think it took a few days. And then all of a sudden, I just felt completely different. And um, I felt so light and joyous. And, but the thing that I really remember is I felt this love for everybody mm -hmm. and everybody I looked at, I just felt connected to mm -hmm. and coming here was amazing mm -hmm. because I loved everybody, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it was really wonderful mm -hmm. that feeling that I had. And um, what was the last part of it? You wanted to know oh, how that, you that felt was... after that or is that how you felt? Know? Then I yeah, think you, I felt like yeah. that. But I also felt like, oh, this works. Uh -huh. So that that was um, that was really That's great. Good. Yeah, that was great. really good. There were some me. other hands. Yeah, I had an aha moment, and uh, it was I had had uh, ten years of sobriety and then gone out like for a number of years, thought I could manage things, but then uh, I was trying to get get sober again and. And all of a sudden, I, I I had this moment where I realized that it caused me nothing, that it was just pure sorrow, pure sorrow, mm -hmm. that there was absolutely no relief from it um, in the in the alcohol, that it that it was poison. And it was weird. It, you know, it wasn't intellectual. It was just immediate and complete. And, and then it was and then it was over. 
And do you remember what, what you were doing when that happened? Yes, I was out on a trail walking and I had been listening to um, a series of talks by uh, Geshe Kilsang Wangmo mm -hmm. about um, Buddhist philosophy. And then, and it was powerful. And all of a sudden I made a connection that I had never in my life connected mm -hmm. before. And it was, it was like night and day. Mm -hmm. Like I can't, I mean, the realization was so immediate that, that there was, and it was not a thought out thing. Hmm. It was weird. And it sounds yeah. like it felt good, but it was done. It was, yeah, it was done. Yeah. It was a turning point. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like exploring the, the Buddhist practice has presented a lot of aha moments. Mm -hmm. And um, some of them have come in my readings of Pema Chodron specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, and I find that I have a tendency to brood about many different things. Um, there's a lot of like illness and dysfunction within my family, um, primarily with my mother, but it's kind of rippled outward and impacted everybody's life. So, um, I think that I've had a tendency to brood since I was a child really. And then it kind of just extrap extrapolates out into other aspects of the world that are outside of the family unit. But something I always remember that uh, I read in one of Pema's books was um, the simple kind of mantra, thinking, mm -hmm. thinking, thinking. And so when I feel like I'm overwhelmed with my own thoughts, I'll return to that mantra. Mm -hmm. And every time that I think of it, it feels like an aha moment. Because... Mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, that whole like mirage that's just like tantalizing me with torture in my mind, just like sort of wisps away, mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, wow, I, I really don't have to do this to myself. So that's kind of a recurring aha moment for me. How does it feel when that, when it, when you get it's reminded? a huge relief. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, whoa, why, why am I hypnotized by these thoughts? Mm -hmm. You know. So. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Oops. Um, very similarly to what others have been saying in their aha moments, I did a small experiment with myself, if you will, um, as I am a new practitioner of the Buddhist practice and meditation in general. Um, <clears throat> so I kind of went all in for a bit, you know, with my per research on my personal time, thinking about it at work, coming in almost every day, guys. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I, for some reason, like something had happened and I thought, you know what, I just, maybe I can do this at home. I can entertain this kind of practice by myself. And I went a couple of weeks and I started feeling really low in energy and then um, I was like, what What am I doing differently now than I was a few weeks ago when I felt lighter? Oh, well, I stopped going to practice and I stopped showing up in the community, which is vital for me in my energy space, um, having the community. And when I return, which is now more frequently, and I do not take as long of breaks, <laughs> like days away, guys, um, I just realize every time that it's like, aha, the thing is that I need to be connected to the community who's doing the work. And it's an aha moment every time I show up. It's mm. so kind and nice. Mm. No, it's good. So I think I've had many aha moments since I've come to the temple and the way I see it is it's usually a connecting of the dots. So mm -hmm. it, it, it starts as like learning something on the path. And then at some point it connects with your personal life and, and things make sense mm -hmm. and that instigates a change. So there's been many of them and most of them are probably too personal to mention here, but I'll, I'll bring up one that occurred um, I think in our culture, we, you know, our psychology culture, we tend to blame our parents for 
whatever suffering we have, specifically our mother. And I was definitely no exception to that particular phenomena. Um, but I was doing practice on Tonglen and just learning a lot. This is very early in the first year I was coming here. And I remember a moment um, where I was sitting, my mother was sitting in front of me and my kids were in between us squabbling and fighting and just going at it. And I looked at her and I was like, oh, I get it. This is really hard, this mm -hmm. parenting thing. And I, I completely forgave her for everything in that moment. Mm -hmm. And it's never come back. And strangely enough, forgiving her in that moment has allowed me to forgive myself mm -hmm. because, I mean, she even had less resources than I did. So I, I think it takes both. There's the emotional aspect, but there's also the the practice and the study mm -hmm. that precedes it. And do you remember how you felt when you realized that she probably had a rough too? Or... Yeah, it was a huge weight off my shoulders mm -hmm. because that was some, that, that burden of anger towards your parent is, is a huge mm -hmm. burden. And just dropping that was very, very freeing. Great. Thanks. Do you have one, Connor? No, mm -hmm. I, I have questions, but I'm going to listen to the rest of your talk and see what you oh, say. You might have to wait a long time. How about online? I'm patient. Any aha moments? Nobody's had an aha moment online? Yeah. Anyone want to raise their hand or un unmute? There, Susan. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, I mean, I have them all the time. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned whether you remember them or not, because, you know, there you, you go, oh, whoa, oh, interesting, wow. And honest to God, a half an hour later, I don't remember, you know, I remember I had one, but I don't remember what it was about, you know, and I'll try to trace it back and it's gone. Um, I think it's still there, right? But, but like the specificity of it is gone. But the the feeling that I get is um, shock, recognition, um, surprise. Oh, this is cool. Um, yeah, yeah. How about do you do you remember what you were doing when you've had them? Usually sitting. Usually sitting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else want to share online before I move on? Can you raise your hand if you think of one or have something else? So um, aha moments just is one one label for them. Uh, you know, Oprah wasn't the first person. In fact, Archimedes, who lived like two thousand years ago, he coined the term Eureka, Eureka event. And I don't know if you know this story, but supposedly he was he was a scientist and he was well known at the time, and he was given a task by the king. So the legend goes to judge whether a crown that the king had been offered was was gold or not gold. And so he kind of knew, well, you know, I got to figure out, does this like weigh the same amount and gold's pretty dense? Is it, and silver's not as dense? How do I figure out if it's as dense or not? And he was struggling, struggling, struggling. And he finally gave up. He said, I'm taking a break. He um, decided he was going to go take a bath. And he got into the bathtub and the water splashed over. And all of a sudden he, he realized, oh, I could put the crowns in the water and see, you know, which one by per unit weight displaces more water. And supposedly he jumped out of the tub and went, Eureka. And so that was kind of common, common terminology for Eureka moment. So sudden realization kind of Eureka moment. Um, so the characteristics usually are that you're struggling with something you know, and you can't find a, you can't get a breakthrough. And then you, t you have an impasse and you set it aside and you go do something else. And it's in the process of doing something else that all of a sudden something occurs to you. So that's sort of characteristic of one of these aha moments. Um, yeah. So let's talk about some of the qualities of aha moments. I mentioned five. One is that the insight usually is sudden, just all of a sudden it occurs to you. And some of you said that. Um, 
at that time, usually there's an increase in fluency of your thought process. So like all of a sudden, oh, oh yeah, I get this and I get this and I get this and just boom, right there in front of you. And it produces a positive effect. So usually you feel good at that moment. You know, the experience of of having that cleared up for you is, is a little euphoric. You know, it feels good, joyful. There's a sense of agency, like, wow, I, I get, you know, I really get this. It's true. And it came from me. And there's also a sort of subjective confidence, like for no reason, you haven't gone out and factually proven that, that your insight is, is correct, but you just feel this inherent sense of confidence around it being the answer, which is I pretty, pretty magical. Um, and it usually relates to when you're puzzled by something and the puzzle feels unsol unsolvable with the current thought process and then taking this break. Um, also, it's said that when, when uh, people have these thought processes, that you tend to give accurate and discrete sort of all or nothing solutions. You know, it's like a complete solution, whereas in our normal kind of linear way of thinking, it's an incomplete or partial, you know, not quite the right answer we struggle with. So, um, you know, you have to have this impasse and then you sort of shift to a second phase. And some of you said this, like Jen said, I was hiking or somebody says, I'm sitting, you know, normally I'm mad at my mom, but I, you know, when I sit or I do this meta practice, you know, then things occur differently to me. So it's usually a shift in activity from one thing to another. And there have been some studies on this. In fact, some researchers have done MRI studies to look at the brain, and there tends to be a shift in the part of your brain that's being used from kind of the linear thought, sequential thinking to a more open part of your brain, like left side to right side. So... Um, you know, sort of, I think the situation is you're mentally fixated on a certain problem and you apply to it some limitations. You think the solution set is within a kind of bound set of, of space. And then when you give up on that and you go do something more freeing, then that drops and it makes available to you solution alternatives that you wouldn't have thought of before. So I think that's pretty interesting. Um, and I mentioned the, the MRI studies, they show it, your thinking shifts from the left hand, left hemisphere of your brain to the right hemisphere of your brain during these aha moments. So that's some of the, the kind of mechanisms, what's going on. So this is interesting. And of course, we all, I'm interested in your joy and your ability to solve the problems in your life. And we're all interested in that for other people. But how does it relate to our our Buddhist path, you know, and what can we learn from it and how can we leverage this or, you know, have it synergistic with our, our uh, practice. And, you know, in this aha moments, you can go on the internet and there are endless presentations, videos and whatnot about them from a secular point of view. But I think the real juice is understanding from Buddhist perspective, what's going on. Um, so, but maybe you heard some parallels and of course, some of you said that it happens when I practice. But when we practice, we tend, if we're practicing shamatha meditation, we're tending to let the mind calm, you know, and part of it's all this turning, turning thought thinking that we normally do in our everyday life, we let it calm down and it lets that creativity come through. So it's, I think it's part of the practice is to do things that are conducive to these kind of moments. Um, so another question for you, did any of you, when you started practicing meditation, happen to notice that some amazing things started happening in your life? You know, maybe not when you were meditating, but you're meditating, meditating, and then all of a sudden just these like things start happening in your life and you're, well, this is interesting. I mean, it happened for me like that. Maybe some of the rest of you have that. So um I think by by doing our shamatha practice, meditating, it allows kind of the natural intelligence that we have to arise. Um, in fact, many of our practices are designed to reduce the delusions and distortions in our thinking. So by sort of by definition, the Buddhist practices are, are designed around that. 
So I started thinking about this topic and I went into my Darshan's interviews with Lama and said, okay, Lama, I want to talk about aha moments and, you know, explained what they were. And he's like, oh, okay. And I said, okay, I get that they happen, but why do they happen? You know, how come we can just be like going for a walk and then boom, we, things occur to us or for people that are maybe more creative, it is like a continuous process, but where does it come from? You know, one minute you're confused and the next minute it's like, oh, that's so easy. And he said, well, the, you get the answer because you always knew it. Well, that's pretty cool, but okay. But why one minute do we not know it? And the next minute we know it. And he, he sort of said, basically you have in your, in your clarity, all the building blocks, you know, you have the pieces in place, you have the, all the building blocks you need. And when you get to that sort of Zen space, the right causes and conditions, then they go together, you know, which is pretty cool, I think. And, but that, that level of consciousness is not available when we're fixated on something. So the trick is to break that fixation. Um, and, you know, really, since I started dwelling on this, many facets of our practice have shown up as being relevant to this question. Um, in Tronga Rinpoche's book, Crystal Clear, some of us read that recently, he talks about fixated qualities of everyday mental images. And even though conceptually we're taught that these may be empty, you know, they don't exist from their own side, they still show up as being really solid, you know? So life shows up to us like that, like, oh, I have to do all these things today and I don't have any time and I've got to get up early and I haven't got enough sleep. You know, that, that's how they show up, even though conceptually we know that they're empty. And um, in one discussion, I... Lama had with some of us, he talked about the difference between recognizing and knowing, you know, and he said that um, these things of spontaneous nature, they essentially unstick the envy identity. You know, when we get outside of ourselves, then it allows for this creative space. Uh, and it was interesting. He said something at the retreat. Some of us got, a lot of us, several of us got to go to the retreat that we had at Lotus View Ranch a few months ago. He says that this, even though we have these crazed ways about us that our, our essential wisdom never goes anywhere. It's always there in the background, you know? So it's just a matter of accessing it and trying to calm down that crazed nature. He, um, in another conversation, Lama talked about just this recognition, seeing things as they are. Um, and I think that's what these ahas are getting at, is really being able to see the essential nature of things without being confused, you know, or otherwise deluded in our thinking. Um, and I think when he was talking about recognition with some of us, what I got out of it is that it feels really good to re to all of a sudden recognize something, you know, like um, what came, popped into my mind when he was talking about it is when I come home after being gone and my dogs see me, especially the one dog that's a Brittany, his tail will start wagging. And then when I see him, I just like, I smile. You can see it in my face now thinking, I smile. It's joyful to recognize something. And I think that's what these aha things are about. When we can really cut through all the nonsense and really reverberate with our basic goodness, it's a difference than no, different than knowing something, but just like recognizing it. Um, Bradley Jorgen, who's not here, I think he's sick today. And I recently did a retreat um, sponsored by Lana Medicine Buddha with Yangtze Rinpoche. And... Um, he talked a lot about calm abiding meditation and how it it calms all the mental factors. In fact, all 51 of them, he made a point of saying there are 51 mental factors. And he said, uh, Yangtze Rinpoche said, Shine or a calm abiding meditation is the container. And through that, there is wisdom in the analysis. So more ability to sense the nature of reality when we're in that container of calm abiding within that stability the process of analyzing can be much deeper that's pretty cool i think um 
so I have another like tangential topic I was going to offer, including a video, but I wanted to stop here and see if you had any reaction or thoughts or anything to add. I have a question. Yeah. You had a question before, huh? You yeah, were just waiting. Well, I was just waiting to see if you addressed it. What's What do you think the difference is between an aha moment and sort of the standard Buddhist philology of insight and realization and enlightenment? Well, I think they're very similar, if not the same. I mean, that's that's sort of the conclusion I have in this whole study is that in our kind of untrained life, we're mostly crazed and once in a while we get aha moments. I think the Buddhas live in the aha moment space all the time, you know, clear and knowing, understanding all the time. They don't have all this craziness that prevents them from seeing reality. That's what I think. I don't know if that answers your question. No. Did you expect it to be more complicated than that? No. Okay. Uh, uh, Amanda. Oh. <laughs> Hi. I've, uh, I, this is sort of a, almost a, on your first topic, but uh, I have, uh, I had two children uh, in my life and both of them have passed away. And afterwards, each time, it was quite different circumstances in many different years, but in, in each time I went through the process of processing things and, and absorbing things and whatnot. And, um, and then afterwards, this has happened to me a large number of times, something happened where there was some serious push in some direction. And in all the cases of my aha moments, they uh, they manifest as doors. And so I'm presented with the possibility of moving on, but there's some big decision that I have to make. I have to decide to go through the door or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I go through the door, it's a one-way door. There's no coming, there's no going back and being involved with those relationships again. And so, uh, and so going, having gone through the door, there's some big task. And that's the thing that I have to say yes to or not. Mm -hmm. I, I always have said yes. And, uh, um, and it's, uh, and it's happened many times, not just in those kind of super serious times, but other situations. It's time for me to move to another state. It's time to me to take care of my parents. You know, it's, 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 but it's big, serious decisions that somehow manifest themselves as a decision and a door. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and then I have to move on to a new life. And that happened about a year ago when I was pissed off at the uh, priest at my church, but uh, but it's it started to seem like that was not the point, <laughs> and the point was it's time to walk through the door and go and go to Buddhism and mm -hmm. and and uh, move on with mm -hmm. my life, and that's so that's happened. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I find it interesting that as I think of these aha moments, I recognize that. Sometimes I'm having them in the middle of the night while I'm sleeping. You guys have that? You just wake up and it's like, oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, and I I find that that's probably been happening more since I've been meditating. You mentioned that. Mm -hmm. And so I had to think about it. And I thought, yeah, I, I think it's, it is changing. I don't know if it's the structure of my brain or the types of brain waves that are going through that are creating the moments, but it has kind of opened up doors to borrow a metaphor. Um, but also I agree with what Lama says that I tend to think that we have the knowledge. We just need to become awake to it. Uh, and in a lot of that is being able to compartmentalize the clutter of life so that you're open to receive it. Thanks. Anything from Zoom land? Okay. 
So I wanted to share with you um, some work of a doctor by the name of Jill Bolte Taylor. I don't know if any of you have heard about her. She's a neuro uh, brain scientist, basically. And um, actually, I read her book called Stroke of Insight, and it's really what motivated me in this talk to be thinking about her experience and her kind of revelation and how it relates to things. And so I could tell you more about her, but she's done a TED Talk. It's quite famous, so maybe some of you have seen it. And I thought I would just try to share this TED Talk and she can talk about herself. So a couple of things about this. I've noticed for the people on Zoom that sometimes when we share audiovisual stuff, it doesn't always come through well. So I hope it comes through well. And we've added subtitles. So even if it's a little choppy, hopefully you can get the message. And otherwise, you can find the TED Talk online. So apologies in advance if it, if you lose some of the information. Also, it's a bit long. It's like 18 minutes and we've been sitting a bit. So if you want to get up and stretch during it or walk around, I encourage you to do that. And then my last warning is it has a few little bits that are a little graphic. <laughs> so I found myself wanting to kind of avert my eyes a bit when they come. She's a brain scientist. So um, so with those warnings, uh, I'd like to share the video. So I don't know how well that feelings are mine. I know you had to mess with it a bit, but... I think we got most of it here in the room. Well, um, so why did I think about video? I mentioned that in this by this talk, so that's one reason. But I think it's kind of cool in those respects. One is that she's not a buddhist, she's a scientist. And the way that she came to some amazing revelations in this process of what happened to her. And I think there are a lot of parallels with what we've been talking about in the left brain. And the other thing I really like about it is not just like accessing what we know inside of ourselves and our experience, but it's like she, you can tell she has sort of bodies that she taps into something really big, you know, so aliens, uh -huh, processing, we can do stuff that's even outside of our own, what we think of as our own consciousness. The other thing that I like about it is that it's not a matter of are we being logical thinkers and a break from that and do some meditation and go for a hike or something and we have more, you know, Zen to our thinking and we get more insights. But we can, these things exist simultaneously. And I encourage you if you're interested to read her book because there's a lot more detail. But she wrote a book, a follow on book, Whole Brain Living where she even talks about four different quadrants in the brain and these different personalities to the brain and how with training, you can move back and forth between these spaces, you know, so they all exist at the same time. And I think that's kind of cool. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit um, with respect to the path as well, because um, Lama alludes to this as well. Uh, he said, we need both the logical brain and experiential thinking. You know, we need them both, that our mind has this pulsating quality. And maybe you, some of you remember him saying, others of you remember him saying, it's like a sine wave, you know, this movement in and out, and we're always kind of flowing with this energy. At the retreat, he said our fundamental awareness doesn't go anywhere. I kind of mentioned that, but rather that the energy sort of pulsates with this wave quality. He said, discontinuously continuous. Um, the mind appears and disappears, you know, so these modes are, are flowing in and out and that we hover between knowing and not knowing and that that's a very useful space, he said. It's like, he said, it's like bouncing on a diving board or surfing, conceptual awareness, but then that conceptual awareness dissolves as it's happening. And I think he he means that we shouldn't get stuck on these limited concepts. You know, they arise, and if we don't fixate on them, then they dissolve, and there might be something sort of grander behind them. And I mentioned this retreat with Yangtze Rinpoche. He introduced a Tibetan phrase that I really loved. It's called lok tong. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Um, in Tibetan, the hlok means clear, and the tong is seeing, so clear seeing. 
And he said, it's, oh, actually, he didn't say this. I found this when I, I tried to look up the, what this word really means. It's the pristine perception of mind's basic uncontrived nature. Um, and in fact, in this article where I found this description of the phrase lock tongue, they even mentioned aha moments. So in this lock tongue, lock tongue quality of our being is where these things, this insight arises from a Buddhist perspective. And um, with lock tongue, the mind, mind's not reaching or grasping for anything. There's no real frame of reference, really. And therefore, it can tap into more untold wisdom in that space. And in fact, Lama said, even with the higher yoga tantras, we're still trying to see the nature. We're trying to see the nature of things without the context. You know, so we have more unconstrained reference. And um, Yangtze, Yangtze Rinpoche emphasized the interplay of shine or calm abiding with this lock tongue. So this flow, which I think is a lot like Dr. Bolte Taylor's experience of moving back and forth between the hemispheres. He said, analytical awareness, lock tongue, arises through the state of calm abiding shine. And through analytical meditation arises calm abiding. So, you know, I would think of it as kind of going one way, but it's mutual. And he said, like waves, you know, again, like Lama says, waves. And he said, with the shine and lock tongue, there is wisdom in the analysis, more ability to sense the nature of reality. And then with the stability, the analysis can be much deeper, which I think is what yields these aha moments. He says, lock tongue has full awareness because of the shine, because we do the calm abiding practice. Full visibility, 360 degree view, he said. Perfect analysis. So I think Lama and, and Yangtze, Yangtze Rinpoche are saying the same thing, that all of our mental factors are working harmoniously and they're synchronized. You know? So I think that's kind of the trick. So you know, both from Dr. Bolt to Taylor, who was just a scientist that had an experience, and our lineage teacher teachers are kind of seeing the same thing. And you get an appreciation for the depth and breadth of what's available when we train to break from our very limited thinking processes. Okay, so wrapping up. Um, so we talked about these aha moments, you know, that they, that they result from when you get stuck on something or grinding away on something. And then you take a break and you break the patterns, I think, of that, you know, deluded, confined thinking. And you probably were moving from left hemisphere to right hemisphere thinking in that process or, or functioning. And then it taps into this clear and knowing quality of the mind. So we talked a little bit about Lama's explanations and those lineage teachers um, about recognition and insight in the path. And then Dr. Uh, Jill Bolte Taylor's video where she really personified what's available you know, when we can break free from those limited ways of thinking. And then with training and dwelling in that space of insight, many of you said in the first five minutes of this talk that through meditation, you've had more of these moments. So it offers us these, these states, these states that are joyful and have us filled with a sense of confidence. So I, I think that's pretty cool myself. Um, so I hope it's been helpful. And I hope it's been a little inspirational towards our practice and what's available. And maybe we can again do another round of discussion. Thanks, Ellen. There's one in, in the back. Yeah. We're working on the thing. Hang on, one second. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Thanks, Ellen. I hope the guys online who weren't able to hear that or see that very well actually do look that up. So it's a great talk, actually. Hello, um, very, very cool talk. Um, I actually, um, for the aha moments, I, I definitely see that a lot of um, those like that I remember at least um, come from academia. Like whenever you're, you sit there like trying to practice something and then you go to sleep and then you wake up the next morning and or go to the test and then you see the problem and then you're like, Oh, I know how to do this. I, I and then you're like, wow, I didn't know I know how to do this, but I know how to do this, and that that's totally um, gives that 
that's in my aha moment of, mm -hmm. yeah but um as to the ted talk that was amazing um i actually had a tbi about 16 almost 17 years ago now and so i was in a coma for like three weeks and so waking up i pretty much had i had a diffuse axonal injury so it was pretty much like being born again and and having to relearn how to do lots of things that you know how to do i mean not completely but there was still some memory but um yeah it was, i totally um identify with that one that that's a really um heartfelt talk that's pretty i mean yeah not, not a lot of people go through either um strokes and or tbis to actually know what that feels like but yeah that's that's a pretty good representation of that so thank you for sharing mm -hmm. uh, thank you for sharing that video i was really inspired by that as well um and i relate to the sense kind of like a, a knowing that there is this place that resides within all of us that we can access of this kind of like profound peace you know um and the tension that arises and i guess the 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 middle place that i'm trying to access or consider is you know um that things are of consequence certainly suffering is of consequence it's um you know the thing that we're all working to resolve within ourselves through the practice. And there is this funny tension, maybe it comes up periodically. I feel like so many people have presented this question, but how we actually um, address the things that need to be done and give value to like a task or an objective or an outcome um, without being attached to it. Some people find like there's a tension between hanging out in this place of peace where potentially nothing gets accomplished um, or going through those kind of emotions that trigger you to act, you know, uh, the anguish, the fear, the, the anxiety, the feeling of pressure. And I wonder how you reconcile those two things in your mind, kind of like the impetus to act, but also being at peace. You know, does it ever paralyze, does it ever, does it ever keep you from accomplishing things kind of like, remaining in this kind of peaceful state <laughs> you're asking me personally <laughs> i mean i think that's i think that's the challenge right um and and if you read dr taylor's book you see she struggled with that a lot she talks about it a little bit but in the book she talks about she didn't want to come back she wanted to stay in nirvana you know and she realized if she didn't stay in nirvana and she wanted to heal she would have to give some of that up. And she really struggled with that. And, but I think that's the trick, you know, and, and sometimes uh, we talk about um, relative bodhicitta and absolute bodhicitta. You know, absolute bodhicitta, sure, if we're enlightened, then everything's, you know, so euphoric and nirvana, but we have to function in the real world too, or even the Buddhas come back to be in this real world because there's so many of us walking around living in it. So we get the chance to practice relative bodhicitta too, you know, to figure out how to be empathetic, open, spacious in the day-to-day -day life. But I think that's the trick is how to tap into that openness and still do the daily deeds, you know? I mean, that's really the that's really the trick of the bodhisattva, I think. So I don't know how to do it yet. When I'm a Buddha, I'll come back and I'll let you know, but <laughs> it might be a minute. So I don't know if others have thoughts about that. It's just, that's, but I think you hit, I mean, and that's where the juice is, I think. The opportunity and, I mean, that's our edge, right? Stepping onto that edge, that's where the juice is in our practice, I think. Isn't sort of in a way all of this about that edge, right? Like the edge between um comprehending what's going on and making sense of what's going on right i mean there's sort of that i think a lot of people said that they were meditating or you know you go you take a nap to be able to figure something out so taking off you know 
looking out over the edge because you've illuminated something. You've illuminated your regular thought process or your anxieties or your depressions or your, your grasping energy to be able to have a, you know, sort of that edge experience of, oh, what else is out there? What else can I see that's on the other side of my own process? So it seems like some of this is always about where that edge is of everything. Yeah, I mean, I think the masters have just done so many practices to try to get rid of the fixation, you know, and the grasping so they can live more in that sort of open and clear knowing state while going through ordinary life. Yeah, I mean, that's what that's what motivates me about this is all those practices to purify and get rid of obscurations and all that. They they give us the possibility of being in that state more while doing, you know, interacting with in left brain. So good question. Sorry for all of you on Zoom that didn't get to hear the TED Talk. That's my next aspiration to try to figure out why we can have TED Talks here that don't go across Zoom well. So <laughs> Dylan tried. We've been working on this for a couple of weeks. Dylan tried so hard. So Should we wrap? 12, 12 26, we better wrap. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe a couple of quick announcements yeah, first. Um, cookies, holiday cookies, talk to Susan Farrar or info at lines or dharmacenter.org if you want to help out with that. Um, and then Lamas and Kapa Day is this Thursday. So we're going to have celebrations Thursday evening um, and then also next Sunday as well with Lama Saloma is planning on being there for both. Um, great. Uh, dedication, Gundan Namjo. Um, so. And I think we decided the Thursday one will not be simulcast, right? It'll be not Zoomed, but uh, may or may not be. Uh, but Sunday will. Okay, yeah. So Thursday is in person only. So come Thursday. Um, so question about Thomas and Cover Day. Cookie question. Can I do? Can I do a Susan? quick cookie thing before yeah. you end? Go ahead, Susan. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, just, I think Connor did mention cookies. So like we're doing the cookie distribution um, in just two weeks. So um, I'll have something in the roar uh, next week, but um, we're going to need many dozens of homemade cookies. So anybody who is interested in contributing a two dozen, five dozen homemade cookies, um, probably it would be great if they could be at the temple in the kitchen um, by either Friday the 15th or in the morning of Saturday the 16th because of when we will distribute them, pack them up and distribute them will be the afternoon of Saturday the 16th. Um, so also keep in mind, if you're at all interested in helping with packing them up um, and going and knocking on doors and saying happy holidays to our neighbors, um, there will be the, I'll need maybe half a dozen to eight people um, to help me do all of this stuff. So that will be, early afternoon on Saturday the 16th. I'll have more in the roar later. So thanks. And um, anybody who needs to contact me, please do. Thanks, Susan. Um, we have another uh, just quick regular thing. Um, you know, please help us keep the lights on. There's donation boxes in the back and also in the dojo. Um, and we have a wonderful donor who did a matching $5,000 donation grant. So um, hopefully we can match that and uh, be wonderful it would be absolutely amazing i think uh, that extended to the 10th of december is what december. i understand yeah so let's uh you know be loose with our pocketbooks even though there's no alcohol involved <laughs> still make some great donations and we're hopeful worthy cause we're all benefiting from this and uh, that would be great thanks I just the other thing I understand is Andrew Smith is sick, so there's normally men's group after these alternating Sundays, but it's not going to happen today. So if you brought something to share for that, well, 
still share it or take it home to your or it just becomes the everyone group to the everyone group yeah Oh, Zoom is Zoom is unhappy with us today. I think we gave it too much of a workout. Okay, well, we'll uh, go ahead and read the dedication first. Then, due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain a state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings, without exception, into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezi Tenzin Jatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish. May the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losong, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful give her a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Songkapa, crown jewel of the Somali land sages. Losandrapa, I make requests at your holy feet. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks all, and for those on Zoom, for bearing with us with the tech. Thank you. Omo araya pazaya na ayindi. Om araya pazaya na ayindi.